welcome to the uh, Centre Court MBA Festival uh, and with the cherry blossom, a natural choice of course to be in uh, Washington DC with the arrival of spring. Uh, thanks to everybody from, uh, for joining us from uh, four corners of the world. Um, and as you know, we love to start these events with a session that we call the committee. Uh, and many of you will send in your profiles uh, to be analyzed by the admissions experts and perhaps give some uh, indicators of how you could uh, continue to strengthen your profile, some of the things to watch out for. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, today's uh, committee. I've got uh, Hanan Hussain, who is an associate director of uh, the SMU uh, Cox School of Business from Dallas. Hannah, thanks for being with us. Uh, Joanna Graham, who is a former director at the Graduate Management Admissions Council uh, and an expert coach at Fortune Admissions. Joanna, hi. And uh, Ed Edwina Horvat, who is associate director of uh, the Asade Business School in Barcelona. So um, here's today's committee. And uh, let's find out who we will be uh, assessing. So our first um, candidate for business school is Cristiano, who we've described as the scientist, now looking to uh, move his career towards consulting. Fairly specific, he's looking at uh, MBB uh, and a wide mix of uh, top US schools to get there. Um, Cristiano has uh, varied uh, employers in his background, having come out of school of the University of New Mexico five years ago. Um, GPA, very strong. Uh, GMAT perhaps will be uh, an area of uh, discussion. So, uh, Hannah, I'm going to start with you as you take a look at uh, Christiana's profile. Um, what do you like and where do you think might be some of the areas of concern for the schools that he's looking to apply to? Yeah, so looking at Christiana, I see definitely some strong extracurricular activities, good finance um, experiences. I would say my big question here is the four different companies over the last five years, so the different roles. Um, just wanting to know a little bit more about that. Maybe there's a good story there. Would definitely want to dig into that a little bit. Um, and then thinking about um, consulting, especially with the top three, uh, probably going to need to do a little bit better on the GMAT, especially in that quant section. Um, session. But um, overall, definitely see some things that I really like. Uh, especially those extracurriculars. I like the international exposure um, and experiences as well. Just to pick up on this idea then of, of four employers potentially of the last five years, um, obviously much of that will be captured on Cristiano's resume. Yes. And if Gao Surgical had bought Medline 12 yes. months ago and the companies had... As an admissions committee, you just need that sort of understanding of absolutely. steps they've taken. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would definitely want to see the resume kind of understand a little bit more. Yes, like you said, maybe there were some companies that merged. Maybe there were better opportunities. Maybe um, in interviews often I'll hear someone say, you know, my supervisor left and they kind of brought me along with them. So, uh, you know, nothing wrong with moving around as long as there's a story with it. So that would just be one thing on the resume I'd be looking for a little bit more information on. Right. Joanna, uh, Christiana has very strong uh, academics, but uh, a GMAT score, um, do you think that, that that might fall short for the likes of Wharton, Kellogg, some of those uh, top 10 U.S. schools? You know, I think the, the, the verbal score looks decent. It's in the 85th percentile, but that quant score does give me a little bit of pause, the 58th percentile, um, especially because when you look, there are so many other pieces on his application that show that he does have some strong quantitative capabilities. So the fact that on his extracurriculars, he served as treasurer, he was a director of finance at Johns Hopkins, um, their consulting club, and, you know, he also worked at Fidelity as a financial associate. And so, and then just having that strong STEM background, those typically tend to be indicators that you're a fairly quant savvy or quant minded person. Um, so there is a little bit of a disconnect, so I would encourage Cristiano to consider retaking the GMAT, you know, spending, um, you know, 45 to 60 days hunkering down and really trying to work through um, some of the more technical questions and uh, trying to push that, you know, push that quant score as close to a 48 to 50 as if at all possible. When, when, you know, when you're looking at uh, a resume, do you start with the fun stuff down at the bottom or with the education and the professional, you know, to, to sort of pick up on patterns of leadership and engagement from any individual? To be honest, I, I start with the work experience because I just I, I count the years of experience immediately uh, and then I go straight down to the bottom because I just want to see the fun stuff and see, you know, uh, just understand a little bit more about the individual, uh, something that could stand out and just really um, makes the profile a little bit more interesting maybe. Um, so yeah, that's the way I look at resumes. Um, counting years and, and definitely kind of looking at the number of companies, uh, keeping an eye out for a healthy career progression, understanding more about, you know, 
uh, the key responsibilities as well. Um, so, um, in terms of extracurriculars, I believe we can all agree, you know, he seems great, demonstrates uh, strong leadership skills, and, and I, I love the international exposure. Uh, sometimes we get the question, you know, I took a gap year, is that a problem? Not at all. It adds so much to someone's life. Um, so, one year backpacking, hopefully learning some languages as well, meeting people from all over the world, you will actually meet a lot of people from all over the world on the MBA as well, so that's great. And then just briefly mentioning uh, the recommenders, if you don't mind, I'll move on to the VP, I assume from the current company, and the physician. It kind of struck me, um, physician, I was wondering what that could be. So I would just, as, as a general tip, um, I would advise that basically, whether it's Cristiano or any applicant, you would just Take maybe half an hour, one hour, sit down with your referee and tell them your story, tell them why you would be, you know, looking at an MBA right now and then make sure you choose the kind of referee who understands what it takes to undertake an MBA and could potentially comment on your success, not only on the program, but later on understanding your career goals as well. In fact, I don't know about other schools, but at ASADE, we are happy to share the actual recommendation form with the candidate in case you wanted to talk them through the questions. Um, it's not top secret. It's, um, it's definitely worth talking them through the different sections. Then, based on experience, it, basically, um, the referees will be more willing to get back to the schools a little bit faster than, than usual. Uh, having seen the questions and having talked them through, I would certainly recommend that. Right, so sort of uh, working with the recommenders. Um, Hannah, we were talking a little bit about, um, obviously, a, a STEM background that can be in high demand uh, in consulting coming out of business school. Um, uh, McKinsey, Bain and BCG, is, is that too narrow, uh, do you think, for uh, Cristiano's post-MBA career goals? What I always recommend is, of course, you want to aim high, so it's great to think about the top three. Um, but yeah, maybe considering expanding the, um, the search into different companies as well outside of the top three, maybe top four, um, or, or a little bit more just with that 58% quant. I think if that quant score goes up, the GMAT goes up, you know, you could do it. I think the STEM background is something in high demand for especially those top three. So the fact that Cristiano's looking to apply uh, for business school in, in the fall of 2020. He uses that extra time in the coming months, obviously to get to know the schools much better, yeah. but uh, just to nudge that uh, GMAT score and the quant score a little higher, more competitive. Great. So, um, starting with uh, Cristiano um, and Jen. Jen, the strategist, who has uh, quite a wide mix of schools. There's, um, uh, there's Europe in there uh, and, and a broad mix of uh, top US schools. Uh, Jen brings a background. Uh, her most recent position is with uh, Gartner, having um, specialized in research for strategy uh, before that, and then a position with the International Republic Institution. Again, using business school as the transition, uh, in this case, uh, moving towards uh, a CPG firm. Um, with her, again, solid academic background, but yet to take uh, the GMAT. So um, perhaps, Joanna, we can start with you and what you see in this uh, profile that you like uh, and where uh, Jen might uh, need to think um, what she needs to put together in the coming months. Sure. So there's, I think there's a lot to like here. Um, you know, Gardner uh, recently bought out CEB. So, you know, the first thing I looked at was, you know, she, so she has some longevity there. Um, it looks like she has in total probably about four plus years, um, which I think is good. Um, you know, I think being in, being in DC, there are always, uh, you know, I've, I've received questions a lot about, um, you know, whether you intern or whether you work for either a political action firm or a lobbying firm, or, you know, perhaps in her case, the International Republican Institute. Um, I think it's really important to sort of own your experiences and more importantly, be able to really articulate what results you've been able to drive. Um, and those are going to be agnostic um, of any field, whether it be a political organization, a religious organization, um, you know, or even one of the fields that I've seen a lot and pop up in the last years, people who work in the cannabis field, for example. Um, so I think it's really important to try to divorce um, anything that could be potentially polarizing from the actual results you've been able to produce um, in, a, in a job. 
Um, and then the only other thing that I just wanted to kind of touch on uh, before passing it over, and, and obviously I worked for almost a decade at the Graduate Management and Mission Council, so one of the first things that I tend to look at are, are things like test scores and being familiar with both exams. Um, she hasn't taken the GMAT or the GRE, um, and she was a poli-sci major um, and business studies uh, major at Providence College. One of the things that I typically will try to recommend to folks, especially if you aren't t coming from a more traditional quant background, um, so if you were a poli-sci major or if you were a liberal arts major in college, um, I do tend to recommend that folks, try, um, if you don't have a lot of quant experience on your resume um, or in your academic background, I do think that the GMAT is a little bit of a better fit um, just because the quant is, is a little bit tougher and it's a little bit, uh, I think it's good to basically put yourself out there and show schools that you're, you're not afraid um, of, of, you know, of rigorous quant and more importantly that you've got the, the quantitative chops to do well in the first year of a competitive program. Right. So, so there's a vote for taking the GMAT. I'm going to put the other case. Uh, in the last eight, nine, ten years, we've seen the likes of, of Stanford and, of course, many top schools uh, that have embraced the GRE. And part of it was to encourage the sort of gender diversity that they want uh, in the MBA classroom. Um, if Jen was more likely to test well on the GRE, which is not currently used in the U.S. news, um, Hannah, are you thinking of those sort of things in terms of how's, how Jen's great GMAT score might, you know, sort of bump up uh, our data points yeah. versus GRE? It's a great question, and I, I, I would echo everything that has been said, but on the other side of it, I want to see a candidate be as successful as they can. So if your quant score on the GRE is going to be in the 85th percentile versus a 65th on the GMAT, you know, I think put yourself in the best light. I think also understanding how both of those exams work and how you are able to test best. So, you know, when we think about the GMAT, those those questions are going to change whether you get them right or wrong. The GRE is going to be the constant questions, right? You can go back and forth. You, you can go back to a question. And so um, also understanding what your abilities are around testing, if there's test anxiety, if a GRE, like more constant questions and just understanding uh, that you have a little bit more time to go back to something if you can't quite think of it right then. I think that's okay, uh, but we definitely want to see you know, the ability to do the quant work. Um, I think with the 368, with business studies, hopefully there's some good undergraduate coursework to, to kind of explain that you already can do the course, um, the, the quant coursework. Right. Uh, Dina, you made the, the comment with the first profile that we looked at, uh, just in terms of international uh, experience, and it really is something that's in the core DNA at ESADE and other top yes. European schools that she has uh, on, on her list. How are you then looking, um, the gap year is one thing, how, how do you look at the sort of international experience that Jen has acquired? No, definitely looks like a highly valuable experience there in terms of teaching, you know, at an orphanage in Tanzania, um, as well as spending a semester abroad in, in Europe. I believe not only at European business schools, but for US schools, uh, that kind of international exposure and actually the quality of the experience is, is important. So she certainly looks very interesting. I would love to learn more about her story. I would love to understand more about her as, as a person. Uh, and it looks like, you know, uh, kind of social work, um, kind of these, these cause, um, making a difference in the world is, is close to her. Uh, key values, I would, I would love to understand more about her values uh, because I believe that will be key in terms of choosing the right school for, for Jen, um, though unfortunately she's only looking at one school in, in Europe. Um, even though looking at, you know, career goals, CPG, it's, um, you know, this is the, she, will, she would be able to, uh, to find global positions. I mean, this is certainly the kind of field where she would be able to kind of transition into a position, potentially managing teams uh, uh, globally if she was to join the strategy team. So certainly that international exposure looks very interesting. And then also I, I put a tick in terms of the recommenders. It looks like She's targeting the right people, though it would be interesting to understand whether she has any direct contact with the managing VP, for example. Um, that, that's always highly, highly valued, especially if it's a continuous kind of contact. Uh, Hannah, just one final comment. Jen has seven business schools, and perhaps at this stage, you know, still keeping her target schools fairly wide. Uh, that would be a lot of work to put together for round one. Uh, but also just the idea of, of the, the sort of the core DNA of those schools between, you know, changing lives and changing the world at Stanford, perhaps a focus um, that brings in, you know, the New York element at uh, Columbia and Stern, 
where Tepper might fit in with uh, business and technology. So maybe she still has some work to do to really get to, can you tell when an applicant has really got to know your school? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, yes, I know when someone ha is applying, I see a lot of school similarities, right? So if like I see the same four or five schools when they apply to, to SMU Cox, I can think, okay, they either A, want to be in Texas or A, hey, they're looking really at um, specific, you know, real estate, something that we're known for. Um, so I think in the eyes of the committee, we do often make guesses and I, we have ideas of, of what you're looking for. And so when we see like five things that don't match up, we're kind of we're like, oh, are they telling us the story that is true or are they kind of telling each school what we want to hear? Um, so I would say to Jen, as you kind of think about these schools, have a good understanding of how are they all tying together. So if you're asked kind of why, why Tepper, you can kind of tie that into something that if they looked at all those school, all those other schools, they would see that kind of red line tying them all together. So we could have called this session of the committee uh, the therapist's couch, right? <laughs> As you're trying to read between the lines, but really get yeah. a sense of underlying yeah. sort of motivations. Great. Yeah. So Jen, I think uh, uh, you all uh, sound very positive about the profile uh, as she makes the decision about the GMAT or the GRE, but certainly uh, a candidate um, that has a very strong uh, chance of uh, securing her place in business school. Uh, next up is Marcus. Uh, Marcus has a touch of magic to his profile. Uh, again, looking at a broad spread of, uh, of top schools uh, and working uh, as a program analyst, having spent a couple of years with, uh, with the Peace Corps. Um, we'll talk perhaps about his, uh, his undergrad and, uh, and test scores, but I did love to pick up this fact that Marcus is a practitioner of magic. I don't know if it's almost like Harry Potter applying to business school. Um, Joanna, what did you like about Marcus's profile? I mean, I think there's a lot to like. I mean, I will say I was I was struck a bit at first just by the number one, the number of schools on his list and the sort of the diversity. So very similar to the conversation around Jen. Um, but, you know, I think it sort of struck me that he's probably just in the you know in the beginning stages. Um, you know, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to like here. I mean, he obviously, you know, he spent he spent some time in the Peace Corps. Um, he has now worked at the EPA for a couple of years, um, and he's thinking about you know this transition into the foreign service as a diplomat. Um, I mean. There's a little bit. There's a little bit here, you know, and I'm sure my colleagues here would agree as well. You kind of wonder, well, do you really need an MBA for that? Um, and especially when I saw Georgetown on that list, my first thought was, you know, maybe why are you not considering a, maybe a specialized master's, perhaps in international relations? Um, and admittedly, when when I saw the GRE too, I think, you know, as an admissions person, I might look at this and just wonder, is an MBA truly your top choice, or is it maybe? MBA or a master's, or is it master's and maybe MBA is sort of my fallback plan? And I think especially when you're talking about some of the schools on this list, um, MBA programs want to know and want to truly believe that that they are your that they are your a, a choice. I mean, that, you know, they are the top choice, and that you're not necessarily looking at them as a fallback option. Um, and so I think in that case, I would you know I would really encourage Marcus. He's going to be have to be crystal clear in articulating his story, why he wants an MBA, the value that an MBA is going to bring to this future career. Um, and really just being able to, you know, to sort of explain sort of this, this path that he's taken because it's probably a tad, it's a tad less traditional, um, but it's, um, but certainly, you know, again, I go back to the fact that he was a business management undergrad at, at SMU Cox and I think, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think, you know, he's, he obviously has had a little bit of a taste of what an MBA might, uh, might provide. So he does, you know, he, he does have, um, has some foundational knowledge there, so. Um, I mean, those are just sort of my, my initial reactions. Right. Adina, picking up on this idea of you know, MBA, MPP, or just sort of options ahead, um, you know, we'd love people to join us at Centre Court to be able to uh, talk about those uh, possible choices. What are some of the other smart things that candidates can do? You know, who should they be talking to? The school, clearly, and you as an admissions office are very responsive, um, but also perhaps to find alumni pathways, people that have comparable backgrounds or have made that sort of transition, right? Exactly. I mean, in addition to admissions, I would always encourage, you know, applicants already at an early stage to either search for alumni, LinkedIn or any other channels or ask admissions to, to actually connect them with, with people from the community. And then I guess it always makes sense. I try to focus on certain regions, connecting people from a specific country to alumni in a specific country or even city, even, uh, you know, to specific companies when it comes. And I was thinking, how many diplomats 
do we have in our alumni network? Uh, it's a tricky question. I actually don't remember anyone who, who is a diplomat, but obviously uh, we, we can run a search because that was my first question as well. Is this, uh, is this um, really the best path would be an MBA or, or a specialist master's? So that would be the first kind of like a broader conversation that Marcus should have with an admissions professional. And once we establish the fact that the right choice is the MBA, then I believe it would make sense to kind of talk to alumni from the MBA. And then if, it, if he's still quite hesitant, probably better to talk to someone from another program as well, maybe a specialist master's in international relations. Well, yeah, I think um, the CEO of Pepsi is an Isadi graduate. That must be a fairly diplomatic role. Um, uh, Hannah, as, yes. as, as you look at this, even just the idea of where you've been to school, and three cheers for SMU Cox on this Thank one. You. Um, <laughs> yeah. How does that play through? I mean, are we looking at the personality and what a person had studied yeah. and how that might match with their, um, their MBA or graduate school ambitions? Yeah, I mean, what I'll say is that this is where, we're, right, we're seeing a snapshot of this application. And, and something that's really important to me and that I put a lot of stock in, quite frankly, are the essays and, and understanding the story. And so I think candidates can do themselves a lot, can do themselves a huge favor by spending a lot of time on those essays and really kind of putting together that story. Of course, we're going to look at your background and understand how where you've been can help you where you want to go. But the beautiful thing about an MBA is that a lot of people do use it to pivot, right? Like that's how, it, how an internship can help you. That's right, all these new connections that you're making. And so if, if Marcus has a rock solid story on why the MBA is going to help him become a diplomat, then I'm all for that. Obviously with his background in the Peace Corps, uh, you know, he cares about people. He, he's in wanting to impact the community around him, wherever that is. Um, so I think there's a lot to like here. And I think, yes, we are going to consider where your background is and what you've done. But we also just want to understand how your, your, um, your goals are going to, how an MBA is going to help you with your goals, right? Um, so that's kind of my thought. Right. There. So it's not just enough to wave a magic wand, right. forgive me, um, <laughs> but, but sort of really doing that research and, and how that all fits in with, um, with these next steps. Great. We, we talk about the pivot. Uh, and in the case of uh, Chelsea, who we've described as Miss Hospitality, uh, is targeting uh, four of the top uh, European uh, business schools. So, Adina, we're looking for lots of input from you on, on this one. Uh, has spent the last couple of years with um, one of the major hotel chains and, and previous to that in retail. Um, if that's eight or nine years of professional experience, Chelsea, I'm imagining, is uh, around 30, maybe uh, just turned 30, um, and has uh, very um, clear sort of hospitality or retail goals uh, post MBA. Um, GMAT score is a 630. Be interested to get your input on how that would match up for some of those uh, European schools. Um, and she's backpacked through Asia. So, uh, Edina, as our European Business School representative, I think we'll get you to start with Chelsea. Yes, so uh, maybe one thing we haven't talked about and it certainly stands out in Chelsea's case is the number of years work experience, right? Because I believe uh, everyone in the audience knows as well that the very minimum years of work experience after graduation, I would say generally speaking, is two years. And in the US, that's very much the average two or three years versus European business schools where the average years of work experience is five or six years. And Chelsea, in fact will have had nine years work experience by the time of the program, which, for example, at ESADE, I cannot speak for the other European schools, but at ESADE, we don't have an upper limit. It would be above the number of years work experience. On average, it's, it's about 5.5 years. Uh, we don't have a strict upper limit. It would be important, though, to understand more about her career goals. Um, and actually, our career services sometimes point out to double check kind of salary expectations upon graduation as well. Um, so that's certainly something to kind of, you know, just have, a, have a, a more detailed conversation about. Potentially an interview, I mean, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't invite her for an interview. She certainly has a very interesting profile and I can see a thread in terms of career development in hospitality or retail and luxury where she, she does have relevant work experience in that uh, space. To become a corporate director, though, I was uh, looking at the GMAT, especially the quants, which is at the lower end, even the total score of 630 is a, would be below the average, a good average, I believe, for 
uh, the top scores is, is closer to, to 700 or a 650, we could agree, is, is a good average, but it's below that. And then the quants is definitely at the lower end. So that's a concern. That's something uh, that the admissions committee would probably raise. Uh, and then targeting 2020, you know, the good thing about kind of starting a conversation early with admissions is for chassis to, 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 to take the time and, and prepare more for the GMAT. And I would recommend the retake with the 630. Right. Uh, though we would certainly look at the transcripts as, as a veterans in business administration, the 3.4. Is, uh, is not a bad GPA at all. So I would, I would keep an eye out for the quants subjects in, in, her, in her undergrad transcripts, for sure. Right, so to pick up on this idea of sort of the 30-year-old the, the, the or over 30s applying, at Fortuna, Joanna, we wrote a piece about the over 30s applying to business school. It's been read by 115,000 people in the last two or three years. So, so there, clearly there's an audience there. Um, does that mean that uh, those applicants need to be that much more coherent and clear about post-MBA career goals? I mean, investment banks aren't typically hiring 33, 34-year-olds as they come out of school, but in Chelsea's case, you know, she's drawing on her previous background with the hotel group to stay in hospitality or retail. So, you know, is, is that something that schools are looking at that much closely for the older applicants? Sorry, was that Joanna or Hannah? Joanna. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've got Hannah's and Joanna's, and they all and sound the same. But Joanna, so that was that was for you, okay, just sorry. for the over 30. Um, no, I mean, I think that you know. So I think about another. So I, I when I think about that, I also think about another population I've worked extensively with, and I think being based here in DC, it's certainly very relevant, um, and that is the military population. Um, and I think it just speaks, you know, to the fact that experience comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. And I think, uh, you know, any any school will tell you that, you know, there are, there are certainly there are going to be people who exist at both ends of the bell curves. And, you know, and that's for very good reason. And so I think it's, it, it underscores the importance, again, of being able to articulate what you have done with, you know, with those years of experience. Um, you know, what results you've been able to drive, how you've been able to be a leader. And if there are, you know, if there are circumstances that may have, um, you know, sort of impacted your journey along the way. I know for a lot of folks, there are, there are certain sort of boxes or sort of milestones that they'd like to hit before they sort of think that they're ready in their career for um, to sort of pursue that next stage and uh, that next, um, you know, that next sort of stage in their career. And and so I think, that, you know, again, when it comes to experience and when it comes to folks who are older, um, again, I think it's important to sort of own your experience and be able to, to be very be very articulate about how you spent your time. I think that's probably the uh, sort of that key distinction there is you want to be very um, deliberate and very thoughtful about explaining how you've chosen um, the path that you have, why you've made the decisions that you have, and ultimately sort of how that's all sort of woven together into one sort of nice, neat and coherent story. And, you know, what I often will tell folks is that, you know, you certainly don't have to, you, know, you, don't, you probably certainly have not had, um, had it all sort of figured out along the way. Um, I think a lot of folks would admit that many of their careers have sort of happened by a happy accident. Um, but your job, I think, as an applicant is to, you know, is to piece together that narrative in a way that a school, um, that a school believes that all the decision points that you've, you know, sort of come to and all those forks on the road have been very deliberate and very strategic. Um, and that everything that you have done to date um, is because you, you intended it to be that way. And so I think there, that's the key distinction is really being very thoughtful about um, about the path you've taken and owning your owning your experiences. And applying to business school is a wonderful chance to step back and, and, and think about those next steps. Um, Hannah, just one final question before we move on to our final profile. Um, Chelsea is a brand ambassador for a human rights organization. Now, perhaps that might appear on the resume, but for that to be really valuable to you in an assessment, it's to sort of get under the bonnet of that and understand what that role uh, entails. It, titles aren't enough, right? You really want to understand. Yeah, I actually, that's so funny you, you say that because I was looking at this and I thought, what does that mean? Like, as the brand investor, like, yeah, what, what human rights organization is it? I mean, is it, is, what are you doing as a brand investor? How long have you been doing it? Is it something that you started doing just as you started applying to MBA programs so that you kind of have this, this thing on your resume? Uh, is it something that has um, been really intentional for you? Maybe it's close to your heart because of a specific reason. So those are the things that I always spend a lot of times in interviews trying to get to know and, and understand, right? I think it's um, looking at a resume for work experience can be sometimes self-explanatory. We, of course, ask a lot of questions about that. But understanding a little bit more about the extracurriculars, why they're important to you, how you stumbled into it, was it intentional, was it, you know, a friend of a friend that got you into it, understanding that a little bit more is certainly important. Great, great. So our final profile uh, for tonight's committee session is uh, Rajit, the cloud maker. Uh, cloud, in as much as he spent two and a half years with uh, IBM, uh, was previously a recruitment consultant. 
Um, now, Rajit, I think, will probably focus on his GPA, uh, which is a 2.56. He's more than made up for that with uh, an outstanding GMAT score. Um, but, well, let's jump right into GPA. Would, would this preclude Rajit from uh, top schools, whether in the US, I see SMU Cox is on that list, have to commit yourself publicly on this one, Hannah. Uh, Isade equally. Um, where do we start with that GPA, Hannah? Yeah, I look at the most recent academic situation, whether that's the GPA or the GMAT, right? So if the GMAT was taken within the last year, uh, I would be more forgiving towards that GPA, assuming, I mean, right, we see a 74 percentile quant, which is great. Um, I would also look at what you're doing uh, in your role. Is there any quant work? Now, as a sales specialist, right, hopefully you're pulling data, you're doing some type of quant work. Uh, and so we would probably focus a lot on that in, in an interview and kind of understand and make sure that you're ready. But with the 750 GMAT, I'm not as concerned about the undergrad GPA. Uh, I will say that... Um, I like seeing, especially, I'm assuming that um, because this person grew up in India, this is an international applicant. I think especially what's important for international applicants is we want to make sure that uh, you're going to be successful here in the U.S. if that's your goal. And so uh, having a company like IBM that will be w recognized by U.S. employers is going to be really important. So I do really like that about Rajith. Right, and, and Adina, is, is there anything that Rajit can do? Obviously, undergrad was five years ago, but can he go back and take a, an online course in accounting, calculus, stats? You know, what, what might further reinforce his academic credentials? Uh, yes, I mean, um, it's, it's always quite refreshing to, to actually get questions like, what can I do to prepare myself best for an MBA even before starting? And that is certainly something uh, I would recommend for him, though the GMAT is outstanding, I believe we all agree, it's, it's a great score, but to, uh, to do an online course, um, I believe most schools, including Gesade, we also offer prep courses, uh, kind of like pre-programs, focusing heavily on the quants, because obviously we want to make sure, you know, our students won't be struggling with corporate finance, managerial economics, and so on, so a prep course would be recommended. I would... Um, also encourage not only Rajit, but anyone else who has any additional information, any explanation to give proactively to use the additional essay and, you know, answer potential questions that we might have before we need to ask those questions. It's, it's, just, it, it's just a different, um, basically, it's just good to see that proactivity to, from, from candidates to kind of... Uh, answer those questions even before asking. The, the extra essay, is that's what is there for. Anything to add in terms of your resume, maybe any gaps you might have, any comments about lower than average GPA, which for some schools would be, there would be like a 3.5 cutoff light straight. At Asada, we don't have that. Uh, so we are quite open to kind of actually understand a little bit more what happened. Uh, you know, throughout your undergrad studies. Right, and uh, Joanna, as a final comment, sometimes we can underestimate recommendations. Oh, well, of course, they're going to be enthusiastic, say great things about the applicant. Um, but, you know, working at a company like IBM, if his boss really did step in and say, you know, Rajit is an outstanding performer, that can make a difference, right? Absolutely. And I like the fact that he's listed on here both um, his boss as well as a client because I think you're, you're going to really be getting much more of a 360 view of that candidate. And so, you know, not only are you going to understand sort of how Rajiv uh, works sort of on a, you know, potentially on a team and with his colleagues, um, but you're also going to get a client perspective and understand a little bit more about just sort of, who, you know, who he is as a, essentially as a manager or as a leader of, you know, a potentially a team or a project. And so I think that that's, I think that's a very smart choice. Um, and also I think, you know, with regards to things like GPA, that's also a great opportunity, especially if you're, you know, again, the boss in particular, um, to be able to speak to potential projects or other things that he has done that, you know, again, just underscore the fact that that GMAT, that GMAT score was not a fluke um, and that, that that undergrad GPA is more of the, uh, the outlier. So the committee at the Centre Court Festival is always a bit of a whirlwind, but of course that's your reality as we pull back the curtain on uh, admissions at the top business schools. Um, I hope that even if you didn't see anything that uh, equates to your profile, and well would it, everyone has a personal story to share, 
um, that you'll join us for uh, the next session uh, at Centre Court uh, MBA Festival heads to New York for Saturday. And do reach out to us, send us your profiles so that uh, we can uh, ask these questions, talk about uh, the quality of profile and what you can do uh, to, to strengthen it. So uh, Hannah, uh, Joanna, Edina, thank you very much for joining us on the committee this evening.